welcome to the Must Know Blockchain Use Case Series webinar, co-hosted by ThoughtWorks and BSN. I'm your host, Tim Bailey. As blockchain technology is gaining popularity worldwide, more and more companies actively adopt blockchain technology to empower their businesses. However, some companies and people still have questions about how to incorporate blockchain and how useful it is in business. So this webinar series is designed to unveil the mysteries of blockchain and discuss various blockchain application scenarios. Today for the first episode, we're joined by two blockchain experts, uh, Shang-Chi Liu from ThoughtWorks and Charles Dose from Consensus. Uh, before we begin, please remember to follow us on YouTube so you don't miss any, any practical blockchain use cases in future episodes. You can also find our Twitter or LinkedIn in the description below. So I'm uh, pleased to have uh, Shang-Chi Liu and Charles Dose uh, on the webinar today. And I'd like to hand it over to them uh, to do some brief introductions uh, for us. So Shang-Chi, can you go first? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm Shang Xi Liu uh, from South China. I'm the head of blockchain at South China and currently run the blockchain business here. Uh, I, I would say I'm a blockchain practitioner because running the blockchain technology and business is quite hard these days. Uh, so recently, I became the general manager of South Hong Kong and Macau. So hopefully, I will move to Hong Kong uh, soon. We're looking forward to having you in Hong Kong soon. Okay. Uh, Charles? Sure, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you for, uh, for having me today. So my name is uh, Charles Dossi. I'm the Managing Director for Consensus in, uh, in APAC. Uh, Consensus is one of the world's largest uh, blockchain engineering company. Uh, we are close to 700 people globally, uh, and we are focusing on Ethereum uh, stack, which is uh, the most popular uh, smart contract blockchain today. Uh, when it comes to CBDCs, uh, the company has been starting to work on CBDCs uh, since 2016 uh, with several central banks. And lately, uh, we've been involved here in Asia uh, with a CBDC project uh, together with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, we worked as well with the Central Bank of Thailand uh, for retail CBDCs. Uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, we are working together with uh, the HKMA, uh, PBOC China, CBUAE, and Bank of, of Thailand on a, a, a multiple CBDC platform, uh, which allows cross-border uh, CBDC transactions as well as a wholesale uh, use case of, of CBDCs. And, and we announced a few weeks ago also uh, our partnerships with uh, uh, GroundX from the Kakao Group uh, in Korea uh, for the CBDC uh, project with, with Bank of Korea. So we, we have the chance to have a, a lot of experience in this topic, uh, being the technological partner and builder uh, for those central banks, um, helping them to build uh, their CBDC strategy and build also the platforms. Uh, and besides CBDCs, we are also um, very much involved into uh, regulated stablecoin issuance. So we are helping uh, regulated banks uh, to issue um, uh, currencies in a digital format uh, with the blessing of their regulators. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to touch on this topic later on. Uh, uh, but we, we have the chance to be involved in both uh, central bank digital currencies as well as privately issued uh, currencies, which are both a, a new type of money, which we are very excited about. Well, our topic today uh, in the first episode of the Must Know Blockchain Use Cases is CBDC and digital wallets. Um, so maybe to, to really start it off, um, Charles, maybe I can uh, ask you, you know, could you define uh, CBDC uh, for people who don't know what it is? Sure. Uh, so CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a currency from your central bank, the same type of currency you have in your wallet with a paper note or the currency uh, issued by the central banks you will see uh, on, on your bank account. Uh, but this is a new generation of money issued by the central bank. Uh, so it has the same uh, level of guarantee. Uh, it, it is backed by, uh, by the central bank. Banks, uh, but it's coming into a new digital format which sits uh, on a blockchain. Uh, so it allows to have a, a very, uh, very new type of infrastructure which is more efficient and which allows to essentially build uh, the new generation of finance. 
Uh, so when you look at CBDCs, uh, there is essentially three types uh, of use cases uh, around uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, the first type of use case is what we call wall cell CBDCs. Uh, so this is CBDC, which sits between M0 and M1, if you look at the scale of, uh, of the different type of currencies. And wall cell CBDCs are essentially central bank digital currencies, which evolve between the central bank and the commercial banks. So this type of CBDCs will not be for you and me. Uh, they will sit on wallets, uh, but wallets for professionals, wallets for, for large banks. So usually these wall cell CBDCs are for um, uh, very big, uh, amount uh, transactions um, and uh, and they really help in uh, in the the type of b2b uh, if i can say so type of transactions uh, the third type the second type of uh, cbdc uh, we see on the market today uh, are uh, what we call the cross border cbdcs so it's another type of cbdcs which are deployed between uh, on a network on a blockchain network involving central banks from two different countries or more mm -hmm. uh, as well as commercial banks uh, of two different countries or, or, or more and the last uh, type of cbdc uh, we are seeing um, uh, growing very very rapidly are what we call the retail CBDCs. So retail CBDCs are really the, the, the central bank digital currencies which we can use every day uh, for our, our purchases at, a, at the restaurant or, or the coffee shop. Uh, and usually if you look at the, the history of, of central bank digital currencies, uh, most of the central banks today are working uh, on central bank digital currencies. Uh, about 86% of central banks today are, are experimenting uh, on CBDCs, according to uh, a BIS report. Mm. Um, and usually central banks will start experimenting on central bank digital currencies with wall cell use case, um, involving themselves, the central banks and the commercial banks. And later on, they will go closer to uh, retail CBDC type of use case. Retail CBDCs are also another type of challenge from a, a technological uh, uh, and also uh, regulatory uh, perspective. So usually it comes a little bit later in the roadmap. Uh, in China, uh, which we are all very familiar with, the Chinese central banks uh, have taken a, a very interesting approach uh, into the, their CBDC uh, strategy, uh, starting this time with the retail CBDCs. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's really a very different approach, which is very interesting. And as we know, uh, the Chinese CBDC is uh, extremely advanced uh, and probably very close to move in production, as we say in the engineering world, which means going in a, in a live manner. Good, good. Thank you. Um, Shang-Chi, why, why do you think um, CB, CBDCs are gaining so much attention right now? This seems to be the year when everyone's talking about CBDCs. Uh, yeah, I would say the big background is the increase in digitization of the world economy. Uh, and there's also uh, higher demand for digital payments. Uh, besides, uh, many governments are engaged in the uh, CBDC arms race. Uh, also, COVID-19 and the cryptocurrency narratives have further increased the public's interest as CBDC. So, in fact, with the development of CBDC, uh, you know, many central banks uh, like uh, Charles Stab has already uh, begun to research on CBDC since very early year. For example, uh, the UK has launched the as a uh, digital currency prototype five years ago. Uh, China, the PBOC China also established the digital currency research institution in uh, 2016. So these studies often stay at the level of technical POCs and the monetary policy. Uh, they never had the intention to the large scale applications to the public. Uh, however, for the uh, Facebook's labor plan in 2019 is definitely the trigger point uh, because of the nature of digital currency uh, it could be easily transferred cross-border. Uh, so central banks suddenly discovered that a digital currency that issued by a private, private company may affect their monetary sovereignty. So to maintain their uh, financial stability and increase the control, uh, we see a lot of governments have already begun to accelerate their CBDC agendas. Uh, like like, like Charles mentioned, China, for example, uh, we start the DCEP agenda uh, since 2019, uh, aiming to move this uh, tech from the lab to the public. 
and we also aim to replace cash uh, in circulation with digital currency uh, in stages. The EU, the Canada, the Japan, the US, they all have their CBDC agendas uh, to accelerate this, these plans. Uh, but also for the public, I would say uh, the COVID-19 uh, definitely accelerates uh, the uh, CBDC uh, because for the public side, most consumers outside of China, they, are, they may still uh, in the transition stage uh, from cash, credit card to the mobile payments. Uh, but COVID-19 has bring us the, you know, the demand for the contactless payments. Uh, I, I think most people nowadays have very straightforward experience with the digital payments. And also the hype of cryptocurrency has also added more legendary to CBDC. Some public may, may miss the CBDC with uh, cryptocurrency together. So although the cryptocurrency is very hard to support the daily basis payment and transaction, but they still add a lot of narratives to the CBDC, uh, mm -hmm. making more people think we are, you know, in a process of currency uh, revolution. I, I, I think that's why uh, people talk more and more about the uh, CBDCs. Mm -hmm. Charles, you, you've been involved in, in the, the space with CBDCs for a while now. Do you think that there's, in addition to what Shang Chi said, do you think there's anything else that unique about the current environment that that uh, it means they're gaining so much attention now? Yeah, that's an important question. Uh, maybe to complement uh, Shang Chi uh, comments, which which I really agree with, is there is also some kind of network effect. Uh, if you look at the global economy today, uh, there is a, a certain level of competition between the different currencies. And if one central bank is starting to uh, renovate uh, the, the infrastructure for their, their, their national currencies, uh, it creates some kind of network effect where the other ones have to also uh, kind of fit uh, with uh, the progress of the industry in, in general to make sure they remain relevant. Uh, so there is this, uh, uh, this kind of network effect which has started with, uh, with key countries starting uh, to, to really deliver on their, uh, on their CBDC, uh, CBDC agendas. Um, and there is, as uh, Shang-Chi was, was saying earlier, um, a, a certain level of competition uh, kind of coming up uh, between the private money and the public money, the public money being the central bank digital currencies uh, issued by central banks and the private money, uh, which you, you might be consuming with uh, uh, your fintech providers or, or some initiatives such as uh, the Libra coin or, or, or some others. So when people start to upgrade, uh, it creates a, a network effect which, uh, which push, uh, pushes everyone to, uh, to follow and, uh, and also uh, uh, joins this kind of uh, upgrade of, uh, of finance. Hmm. But it, it, it seems like if, if you read the press that there, there are a wide range of views about um, CBD, CBDCs among you know, different countries and different governments around the world. Charles, what, you, it sounds like you're involved in projects in several countries, so have a view on that. Why, why is there such a range and, and explain that to us? I think we are in the experimentation phase for central banks and uh, different central banks will be at different stages of, uh, of their CBDC journey. So usually as a central bank, you, you start to evaluate the technology uh, of blockchain. Uh, you test different platforms, you test different technologies, you start to test these technologies in the different use cases you want to experiment. So usually this phase takes about, uh, about two years for central banks. And later on, you start to look at the use case. Like why do you need CBDCs? And, and what will be the, the strong value proposition of your CBDC? Uh, if your CBDC is only faster money, most probably your CBDC will not be popular. And there is a risk for the central bank to launch a, a new initiative uh, which will not get market traction. And that's very important to, to, to notice. Today, finance is working fairly well. Uh, there is a lot of optimization possible, uh, but the world is working without CBDCs. So the big question mark for all these central banks is, uh, number one, understanding uh, the technology and different central banks will be at different level of understanding. That's why you will see so many different views. Uh, some people will say we don't need blockchain. Some people will say we need blockchain or we need some component of blockchain, but not everything. Uh, and some others have already uh, made, their, made their, their, their evaluation and know 
uh, that blockchain uh, for CBDCs is extremely meaningful and will be critical uh, for their economy to remain uh, to remain relevant. And in this case, you will see different views. Usually, the uh, on the on the retail side of CBDCs, people will have worries about uh, privacy. Uh, it's important to understand that all central banks uh, will have to uh, uh, comply and follow the, the privacy regulation of their respective countries. So yes, there is a ledger uh, which records uh, the transactions as much as there is a ledger in your bank and there is a ledger in your payment service provider as well. Uh, but the, there, is, uh, there is different of com components of, of technology and, uh, and regulations which, which have to, to be brought together. Uh, but CBDCs are definitely coming. Uh, but what we will see is uh, some countries will move at different pace, um, and it's uh, it's always uh, it's always interesting to have a debate and and make sure you you listen to people which uh, uh, are a little bit more challenging on the concept. Uh, it helps everyone to to fine tune and make uh, make a better proposition. Good, Shangxi, a question for you. Charles was bringing up blockchain technology and, and CBDCs on blockchain. Um, a couple questions there. One is, do you, does, does a CBDC need to be built on blockchain? And why is blockchain technology integral to or important to CBDCs? Uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, to some extent, you could say uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the world's currencies nowadays are already in the digital format. They, they are just stored on the balance sheet of commercial banks and uh, central banks, right? Actually, the cash is a minority. Although we talk about the blockchain, we talk about the Bitcoins, uh, they seem to be the very fresh technology innovation. But in fact, uh, we, we already have a lot of digital currencies. Uh, but you know, for most people, for the public, the tangible cash is the main form of currency. Uh, you can hardly imagine uh, that rich guys in the, in the movie showing off their balance sheet ledgers, you, you, they, they really hold a lot of cash, a lot of uh, paper money. So uh, I, I, I would say CBDC uh, for the public seems to be a very uh, revolutionized technology. Uh, but actually, if you look at the form of the development of modern credit currency, uh, CBDC is just the, the last milestone. So for the all the old format of uh, currency, the money, we, we, we don't use, uh, we, we still use very traditional database and this uh, data stored in silos at a different commercial banks, at a different central banks. Uh, and blockchain is quite the key to consolidate and uh, to uh, these different data silos to make it possible to uh, make money transfer easily. Uh, in, in more faster in, in real time and to have lower cost. I think blockchain, uh, basically blockchain inspired the cryptocurrency, uh, I would say cryptocurrency uh, invents the concept of blockchain. But after we see the success adoption of cryptocurrency, uh, central banks also see the potential of blockchain to adopt this into the, uh, to extend their uh, digital format of currency. So I would say uh, blockchain is quite, quite, niche technique, but quite useful in the uh, digital currency space. Hmm. Okay. Um, you talked earlier about digital wallets, Charles. Can you, can you explain a little bit more about what is a digital wallet? How, how is it used in, in real applications? So the digital wallets are very similar in uh, in terms of user experience to your wallet with uh, your mobile your mobile payment providers. Think of PayMe in Hong Kong, Alipay, WeChat, and and, and many others. Uh, when it comes to CBDC, essentially the back end of this wallet will be a little bit different. Uh, it will sit on a, on a network uh, which will be uh, connecting you depending on the choice of architecture uh, directly to the network of, uh, of your bank or the network of the, the CBDC itself. Uh, so it's a, a new generation of wallet. Um, the experience is very similar, uh, if not exactly the same as the wallet you are experimenting today. But what you will have in your wallet uh, will be similar to the paper banknote you have in your, uh, in your physical wallet. So if you take a, a banknote, 
uh, and you put it into into your wallet, you can you can go to your central banks, and this money is issued by your central banks. Mm. Uh, if you take your your WeChat, Alipay account, or any any other digital wallet, actually it's um, uh, it's uh, some kind of uh, the money belongs to the provider uh, of these wallet services. And they, they make some accounting so they can reconcile your money and, and their money. And the big difference in terms of money between a, a traditional digital wallet and a CBDC wallet will be that on the CBDC wallet, you will have the, the full property uh, of the money sitting in your wallet. And there will not be anyone in the middle uh, to, uh, to kind of lend the money to you or being some kind of proxies. But in terms of experience, as we've seen um, in, in China with the ECNY, it's very similar. It has a different name, but it's exactly the same more or less. You, hmm. you just uh, take your phone and you scan a QR code and you make a payment the same way you do a payment with uh, your, your, your traditional digital, uh, digital wallet. But on this digital um, currency wallet, uh, you will have tokens and these tokens represent uh, real money issued directly uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the central bank. Okay. Well, we've read in the press recently about um, exchanges getting hacked and, and, and current cryptocurrencies, you know, stolen. Um, are there are there risks with digital wallets um, that are different from you know traditional uh, you know physical wallets, Changchi? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, for sure because if you are using traditional you know, bank accounts, uh, basically you hand over your uh, property to the bank. It's the bank to custody your property. And uh, if they lose money, actually they will pay for you. It's their liability. Uh, but if you own your uh, digital currency by your own personal wallet, uh, actually it's your full responsibility to maintain your property safety. Uh, for example, in, uh, crypto world, we all know if you're consulting your, uh, your cryptocurrency, your Bitcoin, Ethereum as a centralized exchange, uh, you may lose your money. So the only way to make it safe is to maintain and uh, keep your own wallet. And uh, sometimes you need your hardware wallet to uh, have you make, make it offline uh, to, uh, to protect your private key. And uh, I, I would say for the CBDCs uh, for different uh, country and regions, they may have different uh, like form of CBDC wallets. Mm. Uh, for example, in China, the DCEP is designed to uh, separate the level of uh, wallet by its amount. So basically, if you, uh, you are pure anonymous, you can keep certain amount, very small amount of money in your own uh, personal wallet. Uh, this is quite safe, like, like you use your uh, your cash, use your uh, paper wallet to, to, to maintain your money. If you lose it, you lose it. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you uh, actually you want to use more money, uh, actually you need to certain level of KYC. Uh, I think at DCEP stage then, uh, your, uh, your money's registration is also partly maintained by the uh, central bank, uh, the central registration of your DCEP. So that helps you to uh, maintain and keep your money uh, easier and more safely uh, by uh, uh, centralization uh, data storage. But I would say the control of the, uh, like the ownership and the fully control of your own property uh, still have a balance between the uh, centralization and the decentralization. Uh, for sure, you can have make it more safe to maintain by yourself, but also you will have more obligation to do that. Understood. Understood. Um, you brought up um, Shangxi uh, Bitcoin, and and one of the first things that many people think of when you bring up the topic of blockchain technology is, oh, that's Bitcoin. Um, Charles, can you can you explain maybe a bit about what's different about CBDCs versus Bitcoin? And then earlier on, you brought up stable coins. Maybe you, if you could kind of elaborate on all three and the key differences? Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, what is very important is to not, not get confused between two different worlds. So there is a blockchain technology, 
Uh, and the blockchain technology has many different use cases. So you can use blockchain for uh, the supply chain tracking, you can use blockchain for central bank digital currencies, you can use blockchain for cryptocurrencies also. The same way you can use the internet for doing many things. So cryptocurrencies uh, are built on the top of blockchain technology, but blockchain is a technology and you can use this technology in many different ways uh, so some people believe in cryptocurrencies and they will uh, for some reasons believe in, in bitcoin for example and believe that this virtual commodity has some uh, some value and uh, this is an application of blockchain but uh, cbdc's are sitting on blockchain but they are not cryptocurrencies uh, cbdc's are not speculative uh, so if you get one RMB uh, on the blockchain or uh, coming from the central bank or one Hong Kong dollar from the blockchain coming from the central bank, it has one, it is the value of this uh, CBDC is one Hong Kong dollar and it will never be more. Uh, so there is no speculation aspect with the central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. And the same stands with stable coins. Uh, so stable coins are also a kind of money which sits on blockchain, uh, but this, this type of, uh, of, of money uh, is not speculative neither. It's not a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's supposed to be backed one for one uh, with uh, fiat money uh, versus uh, one token of uh, of one dollar or, or one RMB. So again, it's not speculative at all. So cryptocurrencies, CBDCs, and stablecoin are all sitting on blockchain technologies, but they are very different. Uh, usage of the blockchain technology by very different people uh, for very different purposes. Uh, so CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies. But CBDC, but uh, stable coins though are not necessarily backed by central banks. Correct? Absolutely. So stable coins are never backed by central banks. Uh, they are uh, only backed by uh, private entities. Usually, it's banks or some kind of organizations. Mm. Uh, it's a new market, uh, a new market which is already 100 billion US dollar of, uh, of market mm. cap. So there is already 100 billion US dollar of, of stable coins which are, which are on the market and, and several hundred billion of transactions uh, every month using this uh, digital representation of money. But this money is not coming from central banks. This money is coming from banks or some kind of organization uh, which will try their best to document uh, and, and certify and, and, uh, and build the trust with their users that every time you, you, you get into your wallet one of their tokens representing, for example, one US dollar, uh, you, you can trust them that they have also uh, the, the same US dollar in a normal bank account uh, sitting into a, a regulated institutions. So CBDCs is public money coming from central banks and stable coins are private money coming from private entities. And it's the first time in, in the history of, uh, of, of, uh, of the mind kind that you start to have these two types of money. And it's very interesting to, to, uh, to follow and, and probably to see in the, coming, uh, in the coming months and years, mm. what will the market prefer? Mm. Will you prefer um, money coming from your government? Or maybe will you prefer money coming from your favorite bank or maybe your favorite uh, technology company? Uh, that's what Facebook is doing uh, with, uh, with the project Libra, now renamed Novi. So the, really the jury is out uh, to see how the market will behave. And my prediction is that uh, these CBDCs and stablecoin will not necessarily compete, but they will sit next to each other. And for certain use, uh, you will prefer to use uh, the money issued directly from the government. But maybe uh, it will be more practical for you to use um, the Facebook dollar or the Facebook of, uh, of another, another currency uh, for your transactions in a certain context, maybe for your transactions online or for your transactions mm -hmm. when you travel. So this, uh, I believe this level of competition is a, is a very positive point. Uh, it really pushes both the private sector, but also the, the public sector to kind of step up and bring much more, um, much more value adding uh, money experience to, to everyone. Good. Yeah, I, I, I also want to add another interesting data point, uh, which because uh, blockchain, uh, the CBD say the stable coin is so emerging technologies uh, that became the you know, privilege of powerful countries or advanced tech companies. Uh, but actually for small countries, uh, they may lack of tech, lack of talent. Uh, 
uh, some small countries, they may choose to use cryptocurrency directly as their fiat currency. So many audience, you may already know, you know, the El Salvador, they officially announced Bitcoin as their official fiat currency. So this is quite big news in cryptocurrency. But I would say the digital currency should not be the privilege for the powerful countries. True. And, and Charles, I, would, I think you made a really important point um, at, at the beginning of your, your last answer around uh, block, blockchain as an underlying technology and cryptocurrencies or even CBDCs being an application built on top of that to technology. And I think another good analogy would be the internet and email. Email is one application of the internet, um, but there's many, many more applications Absolutely. on the internet that's more more than just email and then that and that's actually the theme of of this series um the must know blockchain use cases is is talking about um all the different potential use cases of blockchain technology beyond you know payments and currency um yeah sorry go ahead charles did you mm, yeah maybe tim I'd like also maybe to open the, uh, the conversation to what we call decentralized finance. Uh, so with this new generation of money, uh, uh, this type of CBDCs or, or stablecoin will have new features. So don't think about money uh, being just digital and passively moving into some digital pipes, but think of money which uh, uh, will be a smarter type of money. Uh, money which will be programmable, uh, so you could define uh, functions to this money and, and, and make this money having some, some special use case because the money is just not moving anymore passively, but it's much more active. Uh, so you can design, for example, as a government or maybe as a company, money which will be directional. So just imagine, uh, for example, as an insurance company, when someone is claiming uh, for a car accident, uh, you could uh, essentially reimburse uh, the claim with money which could be only be spent uh, into uh, into car repair shops, for example. Mm. Uh, and that will basically uh, kill uh, all the all the, the problem of uh, false claim and, uh, and inefficiencies in insurance. Uh, no one will have to pay for the for the fraudsters anymore because uh, the insurance workflow will be much more much more easy. Uh, same for the banks, and this is a, a very big use case. Uh, imagine money which will be uh, containing uh, all the KYC information while respecting your privacy as well. Mm -hmm. So this will lower the cost for, for the banks and payment service providers uh, that have to make sure that the, there is AML in place when uh, there is transactions and making sure there is no dirty money uh, coming into your, your wallet or someone else's account. Uh, so this money could have some kind of identity uh, while respecting your privacy and, and lowering the cost and facilitating much more much more applications. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, that's what we call the programmable aspect of, uh, of, uh, of money. And this, this CBDCs and stablecoin being programmable, they open the, uh, a new world of finance uh, with a concept that we call uh, composability. So suddenly when, you, when your assets such as money or equity, for example, become uh, blockchain based, and they start to have uh, much more features embedded uh, into them. You can start to have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, applications, uh, which can be run automatically by blockchain systems. Uh, so this means that there is more automation, there is better transparency, there is better risk management, and there is also much more efficiency for all the banks, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, which have to apply to all these uh, different compliance regulations. Uh, but they will have the support of a new currency, which enables them to uh, comply with, uh, with these regulations in a, in a much more automated way, therefore a cheaper way. Well, to, to your point about programmability, I mean, couldn't a government also uh, make money be time-based, have a time dimension? So if they were trying to do a stimulus to drive consumer consumption, the value of the money could decrease over time as a way to encourage people to 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 spend absolutely so all of these uh, functionalities uh, have to be well sought before being implemented uh, they need to remain um, uh, compliant with the regulation of each country mm -hmm. they need to be very well explained as well 
so that's why it's going to start most probably into into the institutional finance level first uh, to really uh, see all the, the impact of such a new generation of money uh, and to give the time also for everyone to get more familiar with this new uh, this new this new this new money so this is why many governments and and many companies are investing in blockchain and and building the new generation of finance because these new features are essentially impossible to create uh, today uh, with the existing payment infrastructure that we have today shang chi so we've talked about a few um, applications of cbdc can you elaborate a bit more on other types of applications of, of CBDCs around the world? Uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, if you divide the CBDC into the uh, wholesale payment and the retail payment uh, by the usage, and also you, you can divide into account-based token, uh, account-based CBDC and token-based uh, CBDC in, uh, in the form. So uh, we say for uh, projects like the startup projects, uh, uh, jointly developed by EU and uh, Japan, uh, like the Singapore's uh, uh, European project, they mostly focus on the uh, B2B, uh, the cross-border payment uh, between commercial banks and uh, such wholesale payment more focused on the uh, blockchain and the distributed ledger part of the CBDC, aiming to improve the speed, uh, reducing the cost for the wholesale payment. Uh, and also, if you look at the DCEP at China mainland, uh, if you look at the uh, Bahamas, uh, send dollars, they are more focused on the retail. Actually, in China, we have more use cases to, uh, from uh, using the uh, DCEP to pay for the uh, public transport, uh, like to pay for the shopping mall. And also, uh, China is trying to approach it uh, to using CBD, using DCEP to uh, pay as coupon. So we see various use cases around the retail side. Uh, but also the government should be very cautious to uh, extend the uh, program, program, programmable features of CBDC because it's it's not just technical uh, features. Technically, it, like Charles said, it's definitely doable. Uh, it opens more uh, possibility uh, for the money. But it is more about the public policy. It is more about the uh, mandatory policy. So uh, as from my understanding, uh, the current governments, they are very cautious to extend such features to, uh, they still limit the, the, the CBDC at very, very simple use cases. Like China, we only aim to use CBDC replace for M0, not even for the M1. So they don't intend to add any interest for the uh, CBDC, because that will impact a lot to the society. Uh, but in the future, I will say uh, we already see the various, uh, the DeFi, the various uh, uh, smart contracts at a crypto world, and they are all conducted by the crypto native currency. If we could extend such use case uh, uh, to the more uh, broader society and economy, that will definitely change the world, definitely change a lot of business scenarios. Like, you don't need Uber to do a uh, taxi driving. You don't need the uh, Airbnb to do the house lending. So uh, you could see a lot of uh, internet companies, uh, especially the plat platform uh, internet companies, they could replace by the uh, CBDC driven smart contract. You could basically use this. So I would say if we can imagine the future of uh, CBDC based the blockchain and smart contract applications. A lot of uh, platform business they will be reshaped. So you're saying that CBDC. So you're talking about companies like Airbnb and other um, platforms that are essentially intermediaries between consumers and owners of of property. In the case of of Airbnb. So how do you see CBDCs um, eliminating those intermediaries, and, and what are the what are the um, types of verticals or types of applications where you see that happening beyond beyond Uber and, and Airbnb, for example? Uh, actually, a lot. Actually, a lot. Uh, basically, for all the platform-based business, they still trying to. Uh, 
uh, be the intermediary between the property owner and the consumers. So we can basically use a CBDC based uh, smart contract that runs on a blockchain network to, to, to write all these uh, commercial contracts like uh, what's the uh, what's the uh, reasonable rate for a drive? Uh, how to how to rent a car? So basically, the consumer just uh, uh, send money to the smart contract account, and the drivers will get the uh, money from the smart contract after he uh, serves the consumer. So basically, this will be fully autonomous uh, business. And if you look at the future of uh, Autonomous driving, uh, the, the, we, we all know that, that autonomous driving and electronic car will be the future of mobility industry. We can even uh, put a hardware wallet into the autonomous driving car. So the, the, the car even, you don't need a driver to drive in for the taxi. And uh, as the owner, you can, if you tokenize the, the whole uh, vehicle, you can, as an owner, you can make the vehicle as a, uh, NFT that runs on triple uh, on the blockchain network. As the owner, you can own maybe 1% uh, of the ownership of the vehicle and the vehicle runs on the street to uh, driving for the taxi purpose. And uh, it will gain the consumer's uh, income and directly uh, send it to the owner of the car. Uh, so I would say that, that blockchain plus uh, autonomous driving will create a huge a uh, huge new uh, fully autonomous uh, driving industry. And uh, for other uh, industries like this, I, I could imagine a lot of use cases like that. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Charles, what, what do you think about other, uh, that the concept of, um, you know, breaking down intermediaries and, and going more where consumers have uh, more direct access to products and services? I think there is a big component of uh, having uh, having the infrastructure much more autonomous, but maybe I, I just want to, to challenge it a bit this concept and and asking the question where will consumer anchor their trust uh, in a decentralized uh, ecosystem, and it's it's very interesting for us technologies to think of uh, all the capabilities of the technology, um, but people will not necessarily be always comfortable to interact only with software, or they will be comfortable to interact with software for certain type of transactions. And so for some others, they will still need to have uh, their bank or they will need to have brands uh, and organizations which, uh, which they trust. Uh, so I think it will be very interesting to see how everyone uh, and possibly in different parts of the world, there will be different behaviors, mm. uh, how and where people will anchor their trust, knowing that we will have uh, a lot of our interactions and a lot of the, the finance around us, we, which will be run by software only. Uh, so that's a big challenge, but I think uh, in this process, we will see some banks and financial institutions disappear, and we will see some banks and financial institutions doing very well uh, by reinventing themselves, uh, by integrating this type of technology uh, within their, their, their back office uh, operations. Uh, and if you look carefully at the, uh, at the, at the CBDC projects globally, uh, central banks don't want to shortcut the banks. Uh, they want to bring the banks with a, a new generation of money. Uh, they want to bring a, a finance, financial ecosystem which is more inclusive so that fintechs and, and smaller companies can have uh, the same chances as, uh, as much larger uh, banks, for example. Uh, but I think we will see the trust being redistributed, uh, but the trust will need to remain and, and not everyone will be comfortable with, uh, with software-based uh, services only. But don't you think that's a transition issue? Like, if, if I think back to the, the transition from, you know, human tell, bank tellers at a bank processing transactions for consumers, and then you had the shift to automatic teller machines, to ATMs. And I can remember, you know, my grandparents didn't like to use the ATM because they didn't trust the machine. They wanted to go to the person to do the transaction. But now if you ask you know, anyone today, you know, everyone would use an ATM or, or just use their phone. Um, so it seems like there's, you're right, at, at the beginning people, you know, they, they're used to trusting a brand or an institution or a human being. Um, but over time, I, I, don't you think that will shift um, as, 
as people become more comfortable and familiar with the technology? I think you're right. It's a, it's a good point. Uh, people, uh, we have to give time to the market and users to kind of adjust themselves. Uh, and maybe the, the new brands will be some kind of software uh, which uh, everyone will trust because it has been uh, servicing everyone well uh, over time. Uh, so some people uh, are saying uh, software is eating the world. Uh, maybe in the world of decentralized finance, uh, protocols are eating the world. Yeah, I, I would say we need some trigger points uh, like Libra. So if you look at the uh, DeFi, honestly, I, I still think they are quite far from our daily life. But if we look at look 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 back to three more years ago, we, we still I think the uh, majority of our industry still thinks the blockchain, the cryptocurrency is you know more, mainly for investment, and they may never go mainstream. Uh, but no, no, not even mention the, the CBDCs. They are just, uh, you know, some POCs at central bank uh, digital currency institutions. They are just a very technical, very theoretical level. But we all see the, we all saw the history uh, after Facebook, a private company, announced their plan of Libra. So the many central banks, they just, uh, they triggered by this event. So I would say that the future may, we, we, we may need more trigger points like this. This may be positive or be negative, but definitely history is driven by these uh, trigger points. Well, I think, yeah, trigger, and the trigger point could be, you know, a big organization like Facebook committing to invest resources, but it could also be a, you know, what in the internet days was a, called a killer application, right? Uh, a usage that um, became mainstream because it was so convenient and so new and, and brought so many benefits to people's lives. Um, so how do we, again, back to, to CBDCs and, and business, uh, we've talked about consumer to or business to consumer. Um, wh what do we think about um, the impact of CBDCs on, on businesses themselves and, and maybe the B2B relationships? Charles? I think businesses will just get um, much more easy and much more independent relationship with uh, the financial life in general. Mm -hmm. And probably the, it, it will accelerate uh, our digital interactions with the banks. Um, and uh, we will see new products coming up for lending uh for for lending to companies for uh, uh helping with cross-border transactions in a, in a very fast manner so there is many ways uh i think it will uh, it will impact but most probably uh if we all design the right product and the right uh, user in uh, user experience uh, it's going to be a very smooth transition and suddenly the people we start to use uh, blockchain without realizing too much uh, how much of uh, uh, of the technology uh, is involved with this new kind of services. Uh, the same way today we are using uh, uh, WeChat or, or all kind of uh, digital services, and we don't really know exactly how WeChat, WeChat works and what kind of servers they use and how what kind of database uh, they are using and everything. Uh, so I think it's uh, uh, the, the best way is to to get uh, to keep having education uh, on the topic and being open to it and experiment to see what it brings to, uh, to the company's life. shang -Chi, any thoughts on, on B2B? Um, and the impact of CBDCs on, on businesses? I, I think in the near future, maybe in the next three or five years, CBDC may have very limited impact on the business factor because, uh, you know, Definitely, the uh, commercial banks, uh, the business companies, they may need to change a lot of their infrastructures, their uh, balance sheet, uh, because they need to adapt to this new technology. But from the valuation part, I would say we have uh, already we already have the uh, uh, mobile payment, we already have the uh, digital payment, we have already see all the uh, potential that digital currency could be. Uh, if we are not talking about the programmable money. So I would say in the near future, that may be uh, very limited, but still the 
uh, commercial banks, uh, the, the companies, B2B companies, they may need to change their infrastructure from the you know, very traditional bank account to allowing customers send their to receiving uh, digital currency from customer. And they need to know how to custody their, uh, protect their money at a company level uh, in a digital format. So uh, definitely a lot of things to do at this space. Okay, good. Um, so between, we've, we've heard a lot in the press about, uh, you know, 2021 being a, a, an important year for CBDCs. Um, let's, uh, I wanna get some predictions um, from, from each of you. So Charles, um, wh what do you think, what, what do you predict that will be new and exciting in the CBD CBDC or digital wallet space um, between now and the end of the year? What will make so head, what, what do you well, see into the future? What do you think will make head, a headline? So the, the headline will be for <laughs> next uh, next year, the quarter, the end of quarter number one, uh, when we start to see volumes of CBDC transactions taking over the volumes of stablecoin transactions hmm. uh, in numbers, but also in value. Uh, and this will be a very big shift uh, showing that with using the same technology, what is being experimented into the cryptocurrency world is actually uh, being surpassed uh, by the same use of the technology by governments hmm. and central banks. And uh, at this time we will see CBDC volume uh, transactions uh, surpassing uh, the transactions of uh, of stable coins. Okay, Zhang Shi, same question to you. Yeah, I, actually, I want to plus one to Charles uh, that <laughs> I predict the uh, volume of CBDC transaction will exceed the volume of stable coins. Uh, maybe by 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 the Q1 of next year, and also uh, I predict there may be more forms of digital wallets, uh, you know, more inclusive to people, uh, more easier to use it. Cause today we are using the uh, cryptocurrency wallet is still very hard to maintain. So uh, by the end of year, uh, we may see more forms of digital wallets like a hardware card, a smart card based of uh, mobile phone based uh, or even uh, web web browser based, uh, we, we, we could use CBDC more easily. That's my prediction. Great, great, thank you. Well, let me, let me see if, um, uh, throw it out to the audience and see if um, anyone has questions. If you do have questions, you can raise your hand or, or type your question in the, the chat panel. There've been a few questions already um, that we've answered. All right, looks like we've we've answered all the audience's questions. So, um, Cheng Shi, Charles, um, thank you both for for being on the show today. The the inaugural episode of um, Must Know Blockchain Use Cases, um, and we look forward to having you on the show uh, sometime again for a future topic. Thank you, team. Thanks, thank team. you, Cheng Shi. Thanks, Charles. Thank you.